Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 19. 10. Actually, that's titled wrong. I, I had it, I just was giving it a title for the, for the PowerPoint deal. And I put 10,000 saints, but that's not what the Bible says. And I get that from Jude, because Enoch, before the flood, preached this. We don't have it recorded anywhere in our Bible except the book of Jude. Now, how did Jude know what Enoch preached three, four thousand years before Jude lived? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Jude said what Enoch said, The Lord is coming with ten thousands, plural, of his saints. He's coming back, and the Bible is going to identify for you who those, who those are. Okay, It's going to tell you. And it's, you're going to read it, and you're going to say, yep, there it is, right there. So I, I, I titled it wrong. It should be 10,000s, plural. And uh, Revelation 19, do you believe the Bible this morning? Say amen. amen. Verse 11, I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge... And make war. You know what everybody in every country hates about their country? Is corrupt leaders, corrupt politicians, corrupt judges. Corrupt kings and queens, corrupt prime ministers, corrupt governors, corrupt law enforcement, military. We don't, it's the same in every country. We're the people... And we get squashed on by corrupt politicians who take our money and take everybody else's money and don't serve the people. And it's the same in every country, some worse than others. Amen? But Jesus is not going to be like that. He doesn't need your gold. He doesn't need your silver. He doesn't need your food. He doesn't need anything that you've got. He's going to judge and reign in 100% pure righteousness. Amen. I told you in Sunday school that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust out. Okay? This is an emotional issue for me. Because I, what I know about me, what I know about my own family, and what I know about a lot of you, we deserve hell fire for eternity. Okay? That's what we deserve. But that's not what we get. Um, I, I got I got to take a little side note here. I was watching the news this morning, and there's a and I, I found myself praying for the guy. There's a fellow up, I guess North St. Louis somewhere. His son, they found his burnt body in a dumpster up north, somewhere around St. Louis. Some I don't know exactly where it was. And he, they were interviewing his father. And my heart just ached for that man. I'm, I'm just going. And he said, I can't sleep. I can't eat. He said, I'm up in the middle of the night thinking about what happened to my son and who did this. And he said, I want justice. And he said, if I'm up at 3 in the morning thinking about my son, he said, I'll text the, the detective who's on the case because if I ain't sleeping, he ain't sleeping either. And he made a statement. And I'm, pr I'm praying for him. And he made a statement. He said something about, he said, you, you always get back what you put in. And then they showed, he's got a book on his shelf about karma. A Hindu, Eastern, mystic, religious idea that says that if you think positive and do positive, positive will return to you. And if you think negative and do negative, then negative will turn to you. And he said, I believe in karma. Okay? Let me help you with that. You are sitting here not because of karma. You don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to stand up here. 
I had nothing, nothing that I've done merits me telling you what I'm telling you this morning. So I don't believe it. I do believe the Bible that says you shall sow or reap what you shall sow. I believe that. But the fact is, you and I are here because we did terrible things. And God said, I'm going to take the punishment that you would have gotten, and I've already placed it upon my only begotten son. That's how much I love you. You don't get what you deserve in Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you for that. So his eyes, verse 12, were as a flame of fire, and on his head, by the way, you pray for that man. You pray, he lost his son, somebody took his son away, an adult son. He took his son away, he's a hard worker, working two jobs, helping his dad and doing some other things. You pray for that man that he understands it's not karma. It's grace. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. How many of you love horses? I, I marvel that out of all the animals that God created on this earth, he chose the horse to as his Christ could walk down from heaven he could fly down from heaven he could drone he ride a drone down from heaven helicopter whatever he could have done it any way he wanted to but he chose the horse they're magnificent animals wonderful creatures clothed in fine linen I mean, anyway followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen White and clean. I have that underlined. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You know what that means? He's not bending. He's not bending the rules. He's not corrupt. The rod of iron means he's going to rule the right way. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Seven words in your King James Bible and they just stand out to you. King, say it with me. King of kings and Lord of lords. Donald Trump has a Lord over him. And I promise you, he will do what God allows him to do, and no more, no less. And it was the same with Barack Obama. It was the same with George Bush's and Bill Clinton's and Hillary Clinton's and everybody else. God rules this world. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I'm, you know my emotions. They're real. They're true. What you showed me there on that ship in that quiet place, Lord, it blessed my heart. It lifted me up. And I, God, I couldn't get enough of it. So I want to thank you for that, God. But Lord, I'm not the only one who needs a blessing. Your people do. And I have nothing. I have nothing. I have a lot of emotion. I'm going to get real loud. But God, as far as the substance of the message, I don't have it. Your son, Jesus, is the only one worthy to open this book and to bring forth to your people, Lord, and such as would hear it, the word of life. The Holy Spirit giving us understanding, giving us wisdom, giving us counsel, giving us the fear of the Lord. So I pray this morning, God, that you would bless your word. It's already blessed. But Lord, bless it this hour. Help us, dear God, to understand truly what has been given us. And that not only have we not earned it, we don't owe it back to you because it was a gift. And it was given to us because you loved us. Father, in this life, I hope and pray, God, I never get over the cross. 
and what you've done for me. Help me to never forget it. Help me to always know and remember the pit that you dug me out of, you dug my wife out of, you've dug my children out of, the fine good people of this church, all those people watching and listening online. God, you've dug us out of a horrible pit. But you set our feet on solid rock. And we're here to stay. Father, I ask you to bless your word today. Help me to preach it and help me to preach it right. So that you and you alone are given the honor and the glory and the praise. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name and all of God's people said. Amen. Now, I got it underlined on the screen. Verse 14, the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And that was, I was going to preach a, another message relating to that, that 10,000 saints deal, and that's mentioned several places in the Bible, and I was going to run with that, because it's something I, I kind of know, and, but God said, no, we're going to do this, Mike, and I'm glad he did. Because these, this army, these armies of saints that are coming back with Jesus, each one of us riding on a white horse. Courtney, you ready for that one? To ride a horse and not get thrown off of it and break your, what was your ankle? Living Springs Camp. We're 200 miles away down towards Springfield. Courtney's going to Living Springs Camp that week. Horse knocks her off, busts her ankle. Did you know that you can drive from almost Springfield up 44 to St. Louis in less than an hour. We almost did it. But God gave us grace. R riding on white horses, clothed in linen, in fine linen, white and clean. So we're going to identify that. Turn to Revelation chapter... Let's see here. Chapter what? Where are we at? Should be right in fine linen. Where's my verse? Yeah, okay, yeah, we're at 19, same chapter. Okay, I'm, I'm ready now, I'm ready to go. Verse 7, same chapter. Let us be glad, verse 7, and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb, capital L, that's Jesus Christ, is come, and His wife, little W, hath made herself ready. That's us. We are, Paul, Paul established it. It's, it's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. The bride of Jesus Christ is his church. It is his body. People all over the world know what marriage is. People who have never heard the gospel, never read a Bible, don't know anything about the real God. They follow false gods, and yet they all know what marriage is. It is the joining together of a husband and a female wife. They had the LGBTQRSPD on the cruise ship. They had all their had meetings for them late at night. I did not attend. But they all everybody knows what marriage is. It's because God created it. The first thing that he shows us with Adam is that it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. That means that we are sufficient for the needs and the love of Jesus Christ who is our soon to be bridegroom. Amen! I'm ready! Are you ready? I asked you all ago, who's ready today to go to heaven? Today! I hope so. Now watch this. And to her was granted Look at the word granted. What is that? That's a gift. When I went to college, I got a government grant. Means I don't, it's not a loan. I didn't owe a debt. The government helped pay part of my tuition free of charge. Okay? That's what a grant is. Not on any merit. Other than, here you go, this is yours. To her, it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now go back to the verse 
uh, 14. The armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Same thing. And even though white and clean are kind of reversed, the sentence means the exact same thing. Amen? So this army, you know, I, just, I never thought of it until right now. Jesus Christ, in his wisdom, decided to bring an army of women to fight the battle. Because that's his bride, that's his church. All of us, from all ages, gathered together, and Jesus said, Honey, come on, let's go fight them. And some of you women know what that's like, amen? You go to fight for your homes. You go to fight for your marriage. You go to fight for your children and your grandchildren. You got death coming into your house, attacking your husband, attacking your family, attack going after your grandchildren. And you say, I've had enough! And I'm going to go put the devil in his place. Somebody say, I told you, I'm just going to shout and dance and get happy and hurt my back today. My wife goes, oh no, again. Now watch this. Look at your Bible. Revelation 19, verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. What do the women wear to their wedding? Fine linen, clean and white. Where did we get that from? Right here in the Bible. Now watch this. For the fine linen, see, the Bible's going to tell you what it means. The fine linen is, say this with me, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Believe that? Now, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, there's one thing I wanted to do here in this PowerPoint deal that I, I forgot about until just now. Because, I mean, y'all know that with me, there's one Bible that I trust I don't trust any other. It's this 1611 King James Bible. I met a British man on that ship. I could hear him talking. I knew he wasn't the same kind of hillbilly as we are. And I got talking to him a little bit. And we had a pleasant conversation. He's from Wales, England. And he goes on these cruises. He's in the army, in the British army. And he's been in Borneo and been in all these jungles. I mean, that's, that's kind of him, you know. Short little guy, kind of older fella. And I shook his hand because I had to go and I said, God save the queen. He said, yes. And he got excited about that. They love their queen. Now, we're Americans. We don't, we're not big on having a king or queen. We don't want either. Our motto back in 1770 was no king save King Jesus. Amen. But let me tell you why I said that. The queen of England right now sits upon the authority over the King James Bible and under a thing called the Royal Letters Patent, King James patented or copyrighted his Bible, 1611. He put it under the name of the British monarchy. So that as long as there is a monarch in England, this Bible cannot be altered or changed in any way. Here's why I'm saying that. You pick a translation of the Bible in English. NIV, New English Version, Holman Standard Bible. They've all been retranslated out of corrupt texts. And in this verse right here, you go to blueletterbible.org and look at every version that they have online. In this verse, it says something to this fashion. For the fine linen is the righteous deed of the saints, or the righteous acts of the saints. That is a lie. That sets up the idea that we're in heaven and we clothe ourselves with our own good deeds. That's a lie. What I asked in Sunday school, what does the Bible say about our righteousness? Filthy rags. You didn't wear filthy rags to your wedding. Amen. You wore a dress. Clean, white, fine, beautiful. I mean, 
natural beauty of the woman and the dress just multiplied it by a million. Amen. There is no such thing as an ugly bride. Not in the eyes of the husband. Amen. Now, here's, here's why I'm getting excited about this. Those false Bibles are lying to everybody. Telling them that they merit their own covering when they get to heaven. Is not true. Your King James Bible says it right. It is not the righteous deeds of the saints, because those are filthy rags. It is the righteousness of saints. Where did we get it? Turn to Romans 3. Somebody get me a bottle of water. Because it's going to be a long, hard two hours. Y'all didn't catch that. Oh, you ignored it. Oh, man. Romans chapter 3. If you look at your Bible. Y'all know Romans 3.23, don't you? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's what we call part of the Romans road of salvation. This is going to be saved, or we, we're going to witness to them. We take them down the Romans road. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2. Something or another, 1 John 1, 9, John 3, 16. We give them Bible verses and we show them the truth of the gospel. Okay? Here's what surrounds Romans 3, 23, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And that, what that means is the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all, that what? Lead. Now, you're going to choose one of two paths for your life. You are either going to try to satisfy God's demand that you keep His commandments flawlessly without making a mistake and you already blown that one. Just like I did. Or maybe better than me, or maybe worse than me. But God sees it all the same. One sin, you're a sinner. One lie, you're a liar. One affair, you're an adulterer. A penny that you took, you're a thief. That's how God sees it. Amen? If you break the law in one point, you're guilty of the whole law. That's what the Bible says. Okay? So, he said... Uh, being witnessed by the law of God, uh, the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Uh, look at over here, Ron and Sandy. Bless you guys. They're Twinkies, which is a slang term for twins. They're both shirt. I just now caught that. Okay. When it comes to unrighteousness, there is zero difference between Sandy and Ron. When it comes to personal self-righteousness, there's no difference between me and back there, or me and Brother Sterling, or Sparky the Firehead, or Caleb Michael, who's bringing me some water. There is zero difference in any of us. We have all willfully... Are we running out of money here? <laughs> there is zero difference between you and Charles Manson. He broke the law, you broke the law, and you did it on purpose. You did it willfully. And yet, if you believe it's did for you, the one who never broke the law never stole, never lied, never lusted, never coveted, never murdered, didn't break God's law. He's the one that took the punishment that should have been ours. It's going to be everybody in the world who does not believe that punishment is going to be on them. Christ took that from us and laid it on himself and paid our debt and bought our pardon. Somebody say amen. 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 
For all, say this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. Now watch this. Hang on here. Being justified freely. Freely. What does that mean? Amen. No cost. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. What that word means is that there was a just requirement and Jesus Christ fulfilled the, and the demands of the law that said, if you break the law, it's death to you. You're going to be killed for it. God believes in execution. And so do I. Okay? Even if they get saved, there's a, something that has, that has to be met by God's own law, and Jesus took it upon Himself to satisfy the just demands of God in your place for you, free of charge. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare this now, to declare whose righteousness? His righteousness. Do you know what personal self-righteousness produces? Boasting. Boasting. Like those Mormons on that cruise ship I saw. That young man, nice, nice young man, white shirt, dark tie, dark pants, had a big backpack, said Utah something on it. So I'm going, they're Mormon. And he had, looked like he had two other girls, older teenage girls with him, I guess maybe sisters, I don't know, and a mom and dad there. And they were going to eat breakfast and go out on one of these islands and start handing out garbage to these people that they must do to satisfy God and, and, and you don't have, it's not about belief, it's about doing what God said and keeping His commandments. Now again, if you choose that route, I'm here to tell you, you've already blown it, and there's no way to recover from it other than Jesus Christ. No way. So, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, aren't you glad they're back there, amen? Through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. Say it with me. His righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther struggled with this as a Roman Catholic monk in a closed kind of like monastery deal where Martin Luther, German Catholic, Locked himself in this monastery. Beat himself in the back with a scourge. Because they taught him in the little monkey house. That if he had a bad thought, bad deed. He could rid himself of it. By ripping pieces of skin off his back and bleeding. And hurting himself. That's what they taught him. They taught him. That he could remove his own sin by his own beating and his own self-mutilation. That's what they taught. Believed it. And he's reading the Catholic Latin Bible. He's reading the book of Romans. And he sees this deal about the, God's righteousness. So the righteousness of God. And what he said was, it made him angry. Made him mad. He said, this monastery, I don't go out and mingle with everybody so I'm not looking at women I'm not looking at wine I'm not wanting to have a big party all the time I sit in here and I read the Bible and I pray and I read the Bible and I pray and I beat myself and I starve myself near to death to attain God's righteousness God why would you make me have to perform perfectly like you are and yet give me a sinful body that's what he said. Kind of. And then he read Romans again. And the Holy Ghost spoke to him. Said, Martin, it's not your righteousness that I desire. Because you have none. What I'm giving you 
is the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ, so that when for me in judgment, I see you as perfect, totally absolved from all sin and all transgressions for all time. Nothing but the blood of Jesus washes away my sin. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get up there and hang from one of these lights or something like that. Just preach. Man, I love this. It's in His Son. You are now perfect. You are now forgiven. God will accept you freely into His eternal rest in heaven for all of eternity. You, that's your get out of jail free card. That's Monopoly in case you never played it. That's what God gave you. What did he charge you? Zero. What are you owing? Zero. It is not arsenal righteousness that satisfies God. No matter how good you are, no matter how clean you live, no matter how many times a day you pray, no matter how many verses you read out of the Bible, no matter how much money you put in the plate, no matter how many times you attend service, no matter how many times you open the door for little old ladies, what? Nothing. It's not your righteousness. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ and no other. Now, if you don't believe me, let's ask a witness. Turn to Romans 4. Father Abraham, will you come and testify to these? Why, yes, I will. So Abraham is going to be a second witness to you this morning that what I'm telling you is absolutely 100% the truth of the Word of God. Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the what? He didn't say the Book of Mormon. He didn't say the Rosary. He didn't say the Bhagavad Gita. He did not say the Koran. He did not say some Eastern mystic chant. He said, the Scripture says this. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for everything. So, he said, what saith the scripture? And believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Woo! Amen! And I understood that much of it in June of 1975. I sent away... <laughs> to youth camp, to Bible camp, and a missionary from France preached the gospel to this young nine-year-old sinner. By that time, I'd already said words I shouldn't have never said. By that time, I'd already lied times to my parents. By that time, I had already attained the status of thief. I stole candy from Wilbert's Meat Market. Who, who remembers Wilbert's Meat Market? Out here, yeah, big old fat Wilbert, amen? I mean, he was big. I stole candy from them and lied about it. By nine years old, I'm already a convicted, hell-deserving sinner. And the preacher preached, and I looked up with tears in my eyes to my mama and said, Mama, can I be saved? She said, yes. And he led me to that old altar. The preacher opened the Bible, King James Bible. Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 1 John 1, 9, John 3, 16. Mike, do you believe that? Yes, I do. Let's pray. And I ask Jesus into my heart, I never forget it. And I never want to turn back from it. Because what he gave me was the free gift of righteousness. Now, nine years old, June 1975. I have not done anything wrong since then. <laughs> Just ask my wife. I didn't get what I deserved in 1975, and I've never gotten what I deserved to this day. Never. God's given me a family. God's given me a place to live in. Food to put in my stomach. Air to breathe. Legs that can walk. A mouth that can talk. Ears that can hear. Eyes that can see. 
God has given me the best blessings that any man could ever want for or have, and all of it free of charge. And when I get to my home in heaven, there is waiting for me a white robe of linen, clean and white. And God gives me permission to wear it. Because without that, you're dead forever. But it's a knowing death. You will be dead for all of eternity and have the constant knowledge that you are burning in a lake fire. So, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. If you work, they owe you. If you don't, they don't. If you want to try living right and living clean and not making mistakes, try it. Try it for one week. You will fail. Somehow, some way, in a week's time, may only take a day, may only take six hours, but you're going to fail. So if you're going to try to work your way to heaven, you will owe a debt that eternity will not be able to pay back. But to him, verse 5, that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth who? Ungodly. That's us at Bethel Church, Festus, Missouri. We are ungodly. We're wicked. The things that we have said, seen, heard, thought, done. We are wicked. We deserve hell. We deserve the filthiest, low-down rags that anybody... That's what we deserve. That's not what we were given. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying... This is from Psalm 32. If you want to make a note in your Bible, you go read Psalm 32. The Gospel was sitting back there three when David wrote that. Blessed. In fact, let's, let's turn there. Let's get it straight from the David the horse's mouth. Psalm 32. Turn there in your Bible. Look at the first two verses. I count. There's four things in the first two verses that describe how you're blessed. Now, if you want to believe old Kenneth Copeland and let him tell you that if you live right and do good and don't ever make mistakes and say positive things, that he'll make you a billionaire. He can have his money and eat it for all I care. And his planes and his private airport at his house. You didn't know that? Kenneth Copeland has been made so wealthy by the people who have been deceived by his lies that he was... Uh, he, first, he had a company come out and make him his own runway. Then, he took 30 some odd million dollars and bought his own Learjet, private jet, to go gallivanting around wherever he wants to go. He lied to get that. He's going to pay for it. He's going to pay for it. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That's number one. Whose sin is covered. That's number two. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. That's number three. And in whose spirit there is no guile. Guile means deceit. Guile means that you are trying to cover up worthlessness, your own sin and your own transgressions, and you're deceiving everybody and making them think that you're a really good person and you don't ever do anything wrong. You've got guile in your spirit. And you're full of pride. You boast about it. You love telling everybody how good you are and how clean you live and how right you are. And God hates that. So do I. Four things he said in those first two verses. Now what does that match? What does that match? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because that's where the forgiveness and the blessings come from. First sermon Jesus ever preached in the Bible. Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. First thing he preaches is the blessedness that comes from God without works of righteousness. 
comes from Christ. So, back here in Romans chapter 4, verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Hands are what? Covered. Has the devil ever tried to tell you? John said, Amen, so I'm going to move on. No. <laughs> Has the devil ever tried to tell you? I'm going to dig all that stuff back up. And I'm going to throw it back on you. And you're going to go right back to the old self. And I'm going to tell everybody who you really are. He told you that, but he lied. Because, and I sailed it this week. I sailed the... Where God has taken every one of my sins and cast them into the depths of the sea and they're never coming back up again. Amen? So, tell everybody else. Kid, please... Can we cover that up? Christ did. I, Sterling and I had, we, we were with, I, I'll go ahead and tell it, Brother John Uter is having bad problems in his church. They literally, they literally came in after Sunday school. People had never been members of that church. They came to school, confronted him, and tossed him out of his own church. Then they started accusing him of this and accusing him of that and accusing, him of this, accusing his wife of things, accusing his daughter. While we were sitting there at his table praying with him and drinking coffee, his daughter came down and said, I just got fired from the factory there in Lebanon. They said, I called in a bomb threat. I had... And John stood up, teared. John Big, you know John, big old Bavarian German guy, Uder is his name. Big rough man. Tears in his eyes. He said, Mike, they're accusing me of things I never did. And the Holy Ghost said, Mike, remember Psalm 32? And I went, I said, John, anything wrong? He said, yeah. John, have you ever done anything wrong since you've been saved? Yeah. John, have you ever done anything wrong and sinful since you've been in the ministry? He said, yeah. I said, why aren't they accusing you of that? And he looked at me and I quoted Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. I said, the devil can't because they're covered. And God's not bringing them back up against you ever. Ever, ever, ever. Somebody say amen to that. You, you, the more you say amen, I'll cut it down shorter. I hope God puts that little boy right there. Amen. He's got it. That's what Abraham said. Is Abraham a liar? No. Turn to Romans 4.18, describing Abraham. The Bible says, who against hope, believed in hope. Abram, Abram, Abraham, 100 years old. And he made a baby. Sarah, 90 years old. Her time had long passed. And God fulfilled a promise that He made to Abram, that He made to her, even when she lied and left in Jesus' face. Jesus said, I promise you, this time next year, you're going to be holding a child. What did Sarah do to deserve the blessing of having her own child? Absolutely nothing. God gave it to her as a gift, and God gives it to you freely as His gift. Somebody say amen. So, against hope, the circumstances around him are telling him this is not possible. But with God, how many things are possible? All things. Uh, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. You know what I'm getting? You know what I'm learning? These gray sideburns gray eyelashes my wife was, my wife was grooming me this week we we're out in public and she's going let me have that one Bink! <laughs> tears run down your eyes when that happens you know what I'm learning the older I get there's less that I can do now at my age than I could when I was 19 But what I believe now is stronger 
than ever. And it gets stronger every day. In faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. Can I preach a few minutes more? Y'all hungry? We got food downstairs. I know it. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Lost it. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God believed. When God said it, he believed it. Amen? I almost got back what I was going to say, so hang on. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to who? See, when you do right stuff, see it, don't you? Look what I did. Look at the things that I did. Honey, here's some nice flowers for you. And honey goes, what did you do? Amen, honey boys? Amen. So, he began being fully persuaded, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now, if you're like me, I go through these times where I'm reading stuff like, you know, Psalm 32 in the Bible, and I'm reading that God gives, and I tell myself, well, that, that cannot be for me, because I'm so wicked. But God did not grant these blessings and these promises to you for being good. He gave them to you because He loves you. And you trusted that. Guys, I'm going to give you a secret. Okay? Of what's going on in your wife's mind. Or your bride-to-be or whoever. God said it in Genesis chapter 3. That because Eve fell for the lies and disobeyed God, that God was going to make her to be submissive to her husband. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with that? Not a thing. In the age we live in, however, it's almost like an unpardonable sin if we declare to the world that the head of the house is the husband. Anybody going to say amen? And the wife under his authority. And you, the, when, when preachers preach that nowadays, women throw fits, they get angry, they threaten, they say, we're not going to tithe anymore, we're going to leave this church. You, you keep up with that stuff, but that's God's work. And he made that wife, he put a desire in her heart. And it took me a long time to realize this. My wife was not looking for a millionaire. She was not looking for, well, I'm not say the best looking, I don't know. When she looked up to me, standing here in this church, getting married, what was in her heart was what God said her desire was to be to her husband. God made the wife with tough weakness to realize that she cannot make it on her own. That she needs the man to be what the man is supposed to be in that home. He's supposed to be the protector of that home. The provider of that home. The state the stability of that home. That's who that man is supposed to be. Guys, your wife, your girlfriend, your bride-to-be, she's not looking for a millionaire or she wouldn't have picked you. What she was looking for is the man... Took me a long time to realize that. And church, 
We have that man. In Jesus Christ. So we give glory to God, not us. Being fully persuaded that what he was able, that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, turn to the, in your Bible, turn to the place in your Bible where Malachi ends and Matthew begins. You ever wonder how your Bible just came to fit in place? From what we know, Job was the first book of the Bible written. Job uh, lived about the time of Abraham, is what the scholars say. And he wrote down his life and his testimony. So that's 4,000 years ago. Forty men, over a period of 4,000 years, took pen in hand and wrote out the words of your Bible. How then did the 66 books all come together? How is it that 39 of those books fit in the Old Testament, 27 of those are put in a different place? Who decided what book was going to come first? Who decided where Isaiah was going to be in your Bible? Who decided where Matthew was going to be, or Mark, or Romans, or Revelation? Who decided that? That was God that did that. That was not the hand of man. That was God who put that together. Here's your proof. Look up on the screen. 10-4? You know what, that, what Ron, what does that mean? 10-4, that means you acknowledge it and you agree to it. Right? That's CB talk. 10-4, good buddy. Romans 10-4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to believe it. The end of the law is Malachi. What chapter? 4? Malachi chapter 4. And the very next book... The very first words are the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Christ is at the end of the law. It starts with Matthew and these sayings. So, all the guiltiness of all the sins that you committed, they're over. They're gone. They've been deleted. They've been wiped out. They've been covered over with a robe of fine linen, white and gold. Now, I'm, I'm getting it together now, so hang with me. Philippians 3, 9, turn there. Think about it. Philippians 3, 9. And be being in Christ. What does it mean, Brother Mike, to be in Christ? Well, what does it mean to be in a church? That means you're not sitting out in the parking lot. And you're not at Walmart. You're in the building. Where you need to be. Where you're supposed to be. Amen. What does it mean to be in Christ? What did it mean for Noah to be in the ark? It was salvation. That ark was Jesus Christ. That was God's way of saving and preserving the seed of all of us here. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. We all came from... Hey, so watch this. Being found, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness. You, Ezekiel 33 tells you this. That, uh, you, you'll read this, but it says that if... My goodness, it's 1230 already. I'm going to move on now. I'm going to let you go here in a minute. i got better to get to the Scripture. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law... But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Not my righteousness. Now I remember now, Ezekiel 30. That, let's say that you've been good all week, John, Ryan. You've been good all week. And you've collected brownie points with God. God's got a big ledger of all the good things that you did. They're written down in the records. And you're awfully proud of what you've accomplished. After all, doesn't it feel good to do something right? It does. It feels good to help people, to do for people, to, to be good and not evil. It feels great. It's all written down in the ledger of our deeds. And then, or we think one thing, or we do one thing, so let's say John, John's had a good week. Even his wife says, boy, John's had a good week. 
His children just love Dad. Oh, Dad's had a good week. And he's got 450 self-righteous points with God in one week's time. Super week. Then he got mad and hit his thumb with a hammer and said something. Or something kind of came out of him that wasn't true. Or in things that God commanded us to do. And out of 400 and what? What did I say? 57? 457 righteous deeds. His one transgression, according to Ezekiel, was all wiped away. All, what did I, and I said that wrong, didn't I? Because of his one transgression, they're gone. So now John is right back where he was when he started the week out. He has no righteousness whatsoever. I want you to understand that. Your eternal life depends on this. Titus chapter 3, let me read this, I'm almost done. In love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Even if you did them, it does not merit the clean, white, fine linen garment that was granted for you to wear. Through His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us. How? That's an that's a adverb, isn't it? Ends in L-Y. Abundantly. That means that for every, there is a billion times more grace that can be applied for everything you ever do wrong. Somebody say amen. It's abundant grace. He's got plenty of it. And renewing of the Holy Spirit, which shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should hope of eternal life. Now I'm, going to, I'm going to stop right here. Take a look. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith. How was Noah saved? By faith. Oh yeah, but he built an ark, so he's saved by works. We know that Noah believed God. Do you know why we, how we know he believed God? He built the ark. You know how I know you believe what God said? You're sitting here smiling at me, not going, good grief, would he hurry up and shut up? They're going to run out of food at the China buffet before I get there. Noah had faith, and you have faith, because you're here, and you're listening to the Word of God, and you believe what God said. You don't, not so much what I say, but you believe what God said. So, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. I don't know when God's going to pour out His wrath, but I know He's going to. And I kind of think that He would or should start with America. Because we had this book in our book in our classrooms. We had this book in our colleges and universities. We had this book in all of our courtrooms. We had this we still to this day have this book in hand by a man who's elected president and swears an oath of office on a Bible. And we've trashed it and destroyed it. And all of the righteous deeds of a not yet seen. Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Bow your head, please. I prayed about this. I asked God, and I think he's granted it. You know that a long time ago I got out of the habit I'm thinking I had to have an altar call every service, even on Sunday morning. You know, just the way I think. I'm not, it helps me to not try to sell the sermon to you to get instant results at the altar. That helps me. Because the results that I want to see out of you may not be as instantaneous as I hope for. But I believe that God will do what He said He'll do. But I prayed about it this morning, and I'm going to give you the opportunity. Those of you sitting here, those of you watching online. 
I want to ask you this morning, are you a good person, in your own opinion, and with as much love as I have for anybody in the world, I will tell you, you are not who the devil tried to tell you you are. You're not a good person. And God knows it. And your soul and your conscience knows it. Your conscience knows what you've done. Every one of us. We know what we deserve. We know that we were headed to hell, the lake of fire, for eternity. In my 51 and a half years, I have come, I've thought about it. And it scares me. And I've faced it face to face 12 years ago. And it still scares me. That's my flesh. Why? Because I know what I've done. I know what I've been a part of. I know the covetousness that has run through my mind. And I know that I do not deserve heaven. I don't deserve the wife I have. I don't deserve my children, my grandchildren. I don't deserve you to be my friends. I don't, I, I, what I deserve is for everybody to get up and me again. That's what I deserve. That is not what God has granted me. When Adam and Eve, I, I still want your head bowed. When Adam and Eve transgressed, the first thing they recognized was they were naked. First thing. You, without Christ, are naked and bare before Almighty God. And the shame of your nakedness is on you. It is not in our nature to get up and walk out of our houses with no clothes on. God built into us shame. And there are things that we want covered up. And when Adam and Eve tried to cover their own nakedness, God looked upon it and said, that won't do. A sacrifice must be made. You must be clothed, but not by yourself. It was granted to Adam and Eve that they should be covered with hand. I want you to try to live right. I want you to try to live holy and clean. I want you to put away wickedness from your life, your lifestyle, your customs, your habits, your traditions, your mannerisms. I want all of that for you. I want it for me. That is not going to cover you. You must be covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. This morning, I'm going to make it simple. You are here, and you are now realizing that you're not right with God. That you are still naked, you are still full of shame and guilt. That you have no clothes on. You have no covering. And you're not going to make it. And you come to the realization. Maybe God's been dealing with you a long time on this. But you now come to the realization. That you need that robe. You need that fine linen. Why? And only God can grant it. He grants it to those who believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, right now, for God and all of this company, and I, I have no idea who this is for, but if you now realize that you are naked and full of shame, and you desire to be clothed on by Jesus Christ himself, having all your sins covered in a garment. Would you come out from where you are, come to one of these benches down here, and I'll show you from the Bible how you can be covered and all your transgressions be gone just like that.
The time is now. It may be two. It may be all of us. The time is now. Would you come? Those of you watching online, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it for them. I'm going to do it for y'all. Right now. You pray to God from your heart. God, I'm a lost, hell-deserving, wicked sinner. I've broken the commandments. I stand guilty before you, Almighty God. You're my, you, you alone are my judge. And my transgression. And I don't, the devil hits me every day with this. And God, I want to be saved. God, will you wash my sins clean away? Will you cover me and cover the nakedness and my shame with the righteousness of your own life so that I can be with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb for all of eternity? Jesus, will you save me? Will you accept me? Will you welcome me into the ark of salvation? So that when your wrath is poured out, I'm saved. Cover me with your righteousness. And I'll serve you the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. That's how simple it is. Father in heaven. Lord, I, what I think is my best. But without Jesus without the Holy Spirit, without your grace and your blessing added to it, my words are nothing. And Father, this, you laid this on me, God, and I was so happy. I love your people. people. And I want them to be saved. I want them to have righteousness clothe them. Giving them, I want the worst, foulest sinner in Jefferson County to come and kneel before you and be covered. Father, that's what my heart is. Lord, I pray, dear God, that this message, your word, would not go forth in vain, but it would accomplish what you set it out to do and bring back those sheaves, those blessed results, that harvest for you. I thank you for this church and I thank you for all these people you've given us here. Lord, would you please add your blessings to the word that was preached today. If it's for one man, one woman, one child, it'll be worth it. Father, we ask now for your grace as we live a busy day. Father, convict us, Lord, if we're not right with you. Let us not rest until we come and kneel before you. Thank you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Would you stand to your feet?